I'm going to start up momentarily, folks. I'm just going to do some adjustments and make sure everything looks visible. I'm going to try to keep something on screen. I'm going to try to keep a metagame breakdown on screen while I'm doing all of this stuff. And I just kind of need to see what it looks like on your end. That's pretty good, but it'll be better if I do this. I'm going to reduce it by one row. And I should probably shut off Cardboard Live for tonight. We don't need that as much as I love it. Hey, thank you. I, uh, I shave every time I go to an anime convention. <laughs> About the only time I do. Well, like, shave it all off. Alright, now I think I've just about got everything to a size that I'm happy with. <clears throat> okay, let's do this. Good evening, folks. My name's Phil Gallagher. I run Thraven University, a site for legacy death and taxes, and we're not actually going to play any matches tonight. We're, we're going to do something a little bit different. So I got an email from a friend of mine. Uh, I'm going to keep who they are anonymous because uh, I'm going to be tuning their deck list for an event that they're going to play in very soon. But I got an email from a friend of mine asking for help tuning a D&T deck for a local metagame. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, you know, this would probably make for a, an informative and interesting stream. So what I'm going to do tonight is take the information that they have given me and adjust their deck so that I think they have the best chances to do well in their local metagame event. Uh, Belchmaster, thank you very much for your continued support, by the way. Uh, we are up to 11 months now, and a tier 2 subscription at that, so thank you. So, what, how slash why should we, we be approaching this like this? Man, I am digging the, the way that Twitch changed these, uh, these support messages, by the way. I, I, I like this a lot. Good, good change on their end. Thank you very much for your continued support as well. And I'm, I'm digging the Thalia with muscle arms. Okay, so most of the time when I'm going and talking about deck lists, I'm talking about deck lists for big events, for, you know, Magic Online, for a Grand Prix, for a Star City Open, these sorts of things. And so the deck lists that I'm usually building are very generic. But a lot of times when you go and play on the local level, you can tune your deck list to be far better for your local event. So that's what I'm going to be doing tonight. On the left-hand side of the screen here, I have the expected metagame for the event. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of guesswork here. You never know who is really going to show up to those events. But this should give a good indication of what sort of things we're messing around with. And the first thing I'm going to do with this is kind of group these together into conceptual categories. So let's group anything that is very aggressive and delvery into the first bunch here. Uh, and it doesn't really look like there's there's going to be much of that at all. So, you know, they're expecting two to three delver decks. You know, you're not seeing a bunch of, like, Eldrazi and things of that nature. So, like, the Eldrazi Cloud Post is sort of a big mana deck. And it doesn't really get lumped in with Delver. Alright, so let's look at our control decks. So we have Grixis Control Miracles. Um, we can kind of throw lands somewhere in between the control and combo category. Uh, let's keep it in the combo category, I, I suppose. Um, so really, here's our, our combo chunk. We can move Sneak and Show into that. And our last category is kind of the, the Delver decks. Hey, Arkin, welcome. So for, the, for this player, it looks like they're not expecting very many aggressive decks. They are expecting a lot of control and combo and a handful of Chalice of the Void decks. Um, 
I'm kind of making an assumption here that the Splinter Twin version that they're talking about is the one without cantrips that has, like, ancient tombs and stuff. There is another version that runs the cantrips. I think that one's worse, but, like, we're talking about Splinter Twin and Legacy, so, you know, we're already pretty far down the rabbit hole. Alright, so as far as... Alright, let's, let's give these some headings. So as far as aggro goes, we're looking at two to three decks. As far as control goes... We're maybe looking six to eight decks. I'm not sure if this is supposed to be three to five combo decks total or three to five combo decks and then these ones for sure. Let's pretend that this is three to five combo decks and assume that they're talking about, like, say, some ant. So maybe we'll say somewhere in the line, along the lines of like, so let's assume the lower end on each one of these bounds, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's say combo, let's say around eight. Ah, I have the, uh, the person secretly messaging me right now while I'm talking about this. That's useful. Okay, the, uh, the twin does not have the chalices in it, so I'll throw it into this category. So let's say we're, we're talking about 8 to 10 combo decks here, and then we have chalice decks. We're looking at about 3 of them. So one of the next things you want to think about with this is, like, which one of these categories do you need cards for? So Death and Taxes is never really going to be in the category where it needs cards to go and beat Delver. So the aggro category is probably the one that we will very much ignore here. You know, we're not expecting a bunch of Eldrazi or things of that nature. And it looks like we have combo and control to worry about. So if we assume some of these ones here are going to end up being something like Ant, because that's very good and very popular. Um, we have Reanimator, that's very graveyard heavy. Then we have Lands and maybe some Ant that are somewhat graveyard heavy. Um, there's Elves, that one's unwinnable, we'll ignore that one. Um, but relatively speaking, this is going to be an okay meta for DNT as long as we're prepared to beat Control. So now let's look at the sort of deck list they've submitted and let's figure out how this lines up. So we want the main deck to be a little more geared than normal to beating control and combo. So preferably most of our flex slots should be good against one or both of those. And we kind of need to keep some of the flex slots in mind because some of them will be very powerful bullets for some of these matchups. You know, for example, the palace jailers that are in the main deck can really put a damper on some of the things Sneak and Show wants to do. Some of the quick early game kills. All right, uh, looking at the main deck, uh, let's pull some things aside here. A lot of this stuff is stock. I'll point out some things that aren't. So there's only three Mother of Runes here which I like. Again, there's a lot of control, and Mother of Runes isn't particularly good against either one of these decks, so I like running three of those. So this stuff's all stock. Our flex slots right now are a Runwing Mirror, a Hollowed Spirit Keeper, a Mirror and Crusader, a Sanctum Relic, two Palace Jailers. So these are our flex slots that we have to work with. The sideboard is relatively stock stuff as well. Um, very similar to what I've been playing. So when I'm looking at this, do these flex slots contribute to the plans that I want to, to see? Are they beating control and combo? Sanctum Prelate and Bryn Wingmare are certainly good against both of those. Palace Jailer, you know, good against control, especially in the early game, you know. So if we kind of look at this, like, Palace Jailer, very good against, like, both Grixis Control and Miracles. Mirror and Crusader and Hollow Spirit Keeper, very good against Grixis Control. 
less so against Miracles. Um, I think these two cards are going to be very powerful flex slots. Now, what sort of things am I thinking about? Number one, if this is a meta game where there's basically going to be no aggro, I want to trim one of those, and I want to put in an Ancient Tomb. Now, if you're playing against, like, Delver and Burn, this is a really dangerous card, because tapping this a few times can, like, literally determine who wins the game. But when your life total is going to be under less pressure, the acceleration that you get from a random Miser's Ancient Tomb every once in a while will be the determining factor in a game, and I think that's really going to make it worth it here. So I think that's the first change I want to make. The second change I want to make is I think we have too much Palace Jailer in this 75. So when when I think about Palace Jailer and, and how, how good it is, I, I want to jam that card. I, I want to play it, you know, early and often in many matchups. But three seems like a lot. So I think I want to trim one of those right off the bat and replace it with something else that is good against control. And I think that might be a recruiter of the guard. I think playing... What did I just do? Oh, I didn't pull this. I see. I think playing three Palace Jailer in this metagame, like, wouldn't necessarily be bad. Like, it, it can do really cool things in plenty of these matchups, but I think that's just too much of the effect. And I think the flexibility to find some of the hate cards that we have here is probably important. Now, the next thing I want to do is... muck with the sideboard a little bit. There are a lot of these cards that I, I like the numbers on. So I don't, I don't think I want to touch a lot of this stuff. These are the cards that I'm looking at, and I'm kind of like, are these right? I think Leon and Relic Order is going to get the pass. I don't think it's going to be, like, good against any of this stuff up here. But against some of the stuff on the lower quadrant, especially the Chalice decks, it's a very good bullet to have access to. You know, being able to exile in Antiquity Wars, or, you know, an Ensnaring Bridge, or something like that. That can be very, very important. So I, I don't want to drop that effect. And that leaves us with these two. All right, so if we look at Walking Ballista, like, what of these do we want it for? It's, like, medium minus to actively bad against Delver. Like, it, it's it's fine. Like, you you potentially board it in, depending on how your exact in-out numbers are going to work. But I'm not excited about that. Grix's Control, I like it there. Like, it picks off Baleful Strix. But if we're going to play, like, Spirit Keeper, and Mirror Crusader, and two Jailers, and Wingmare, and Double Cataclysm, and Triple Chalice. Um, I, I feel like we're already going to be hedging this deck towards Grixis Control, and we might be able to just, like, get something into this deck that's more powerful and more broad. Goodbye. And then I'm a little unsure about the rest in peace. So... Rest in Peace is, like, solid against lands, it's okay against Reanimator, and then basically not played anywhere else here. So I wonder if we can just do better than this card. Like, Rest in Peace, certainly not a bad sideboard card. Like, I would, I'm never ashamed to have it in my 75. But, like, looking at what we're expecting, it's pretty average to maybe even below average. So I don't necessarily know that this is worth a slot. So I kind of want to cut this, too. I don't necessarily know what I want to do with that slot yet, but I don't think it's great. Now, 
here's where I start saying some things that are a little bit crazy, and I want to make sure you get where I'm coming from. This is a deck for a local metagame, right? We kind of know what to expect. Keep that in mind, and don't freak out when I say what I'm about to say, okay? Source of Plowshares probably isn't all that great in this metagame. And I know that, like, every D&T list ever starts with, like, you know, those, those 11 non-creature spells, right? Four swords, four vials, three pieces of equipment. Like, that's one of the starting pillars of your deck list. But if we look at what we expect, like, it's great versus Grixis Delver. It's okay versus Depths and Lands. And then against most of the rest of these, it's just, like, bad. Like, let's just assume we're losing to Elves, because, you know, that's that's probably going to happen. Um, I don't really know that that Source of Plowshares as a, as a four of is going to make a lot of sense. So I'm actually somewhat inclined to stick one of those into the sideboard. And stick some other card into the main deck that's a little bit more flexible. And I know, I know that's weird, but it feels kind of right. I don't necessarily know that, like, I want to drop Path to Exile from the, the sideboard. Like, because against, like, Delver, Depths, Lands, even Reanimator, like, it's, it's got some real utility. But I kind of think that, that some of the spot removal here is pretty weak. Yeah, it's, it's kind of weird if we're at a place in Legacy where, like, you feel like, you know, I, I feel like I can pretty safely cut at Swords to Plowshares. Alright, so the next question I want to ask is, is this a Brightling metagame? Because I think that card is sweet, and I love to shove it into decks when I can. So against Grixis Delver, it's like, good. Not amazing, but good. Uh, the issue being that, like, against Gurmag Angler, it's a little bit outclassed. But it's a great potential source of life gain. It's very hard to answer for the Miracles matchup, and it's a pretty solid clock versus, like, some of these, these combo decks. It also has the upside of being able to, like, attack through a bridge against something like, say, your, your like, Blood Moon decks. So I kind of want to throw one of those into the sideboard. I don't know whether or not like it's 100% going to end up staying, but I kind of like it. All right, so where does that leave us with this, this main deck slot if I'm going to cut a Swords to Plowshares? I want the card to be good against combo. I, I think that's, that's a given. I think the question is, like, how do we want to use that slot? Oh, can I not do any more than this right now in this window mode? Okay, there we go, there we go. Alright, so I'm just going to kind of scroll through and look at some things that we can put in. And I apparently have some cards to return from the last stream that I forgot about. Alright, so I think Remorseful Cleric could be a fine choice. Like, we are expecting some graveyard-based decks in the metagame. It's not like the fastest card ever, but it, it's reasonable, and it's still an okay clock versus some of these decks. You know, getting a Light from the Loam or a Punishing Fire out of lands can be pretty clutch for a Game 1 scenario. I'd be more inclined to do that if I was going to see like some dredge in the metagame, then, then I think I'd be all over that decision. Yeah, I, I think Sanctum Prelate is a totally reasonable call for this slot. But I wanna I wanna scroll through and just like look at some of my options. Like I think Remorseful Cleric is okay. I think another Vryn Wingmare is a real possibility. Yeah, Cleric is is nice against Delver because like it just trades with a flipped Delver. That's fine. So I think Cleric's fine, I think Wingmare's fine. How does another Revoker go? Bad here, good against a bunch of this stuff. I don't know that I love that. Yeah, Spirit of Labyrinth is, a, is another real call. 
I don't really like another generic beater in the main deck. Like, we're so worried about beating combo and control that just like a 3-3 flyer, I don't think that's where I want to be. We don't go like Leon and Arbiter Deep here. Um... There's also the possibility of playing another hate bear in the board, like I can tame a priest or a canonist. The problem with priest is that, like, if you're expecting some of your graveyard decks to just be kind of like side graveyard decks, and th that aren't like bringing creatures back, then like containment priest doesn't do anything at improving a matchup like this one. So I think our best options are probably like remorseful cleric. Spirit of the Labyrinth or Vryn Wingmare number three. I think those are probably the things that I would consider putting into this main deck. What's the cantrip count going to be like for this? So like Miracles, Grixis Control, Grixis Delver, Sneak and Show, Splinter Twin, so of, of the decks that are expected, so let's go on the higher number of speeds. 4, 8, 11, 12, 13 of the decks that are going to be there are going to be cantrip decks. Is Recruiter 3 a consideration over Wingmare 2? Okay, let's, let's, let's play with that idea. If we move this here, we get another very good card against control decks. And we get more copies of Wingmare Prelate Palace Jailer in game one. I don't hate that. Now, generally speaking, in in say an open metagame where you are expecting more copies of aggressive decks, I don't really love that. But here it might be correct. My, my general impression is that if you want to play the third recruiter, it should be in the sideboard. My only worry about doing this is that like this, this is slow, and these are slow. So we're going to lose out on some ability to pressure in the early game if we go this heavy on sort of the, the fat side of the deck. But if we're expecting a lot of this stuff to go long, maybe that's okay. All right, so like let's let's say we're gonna play the third recruiter main. What does that do to everything else? That probably makes the brightling worse. Now I know you might be saying like, well, well, why? Because like you were keen on that card a minute ago. Now we're gonna hedge more strongly against control in game one, so I probably want to do something else to improve the combo decks for the post-sideboard games. Uh, moving a Jailer into the board is, is something reasonable as well. Let's figure out what we do with those slots if I do that, though. The thing about the Jailer is, though, that if you're playing against these control decks, you really just want to slam it on turn four. And so playing a second copy of that increases your chances of doing that. Like, you'd just love to have that in the early game against Miracles or Grixis Control, before they have, like, their setup in place to just, like, answer it and attack it and steal the crown. But it is possible that this, this is just too much fat. The other thing is that if I'm going to play the third recruiter in the main deck, I don't necessarily want to take the vial up to four. All right, thinking, thinking to myself here, or do we? And is this a metagame where we can go like Restoration Angel Deep? I don't think so. I think there's too much combo for that. But it's real annoying for those control decks, and it's actually better than it looks against Delver. Having a 3-4 body that just can blank a Delver is pretty gross.
All right, so let's let's think about the sideboard and let's consider doing something else with this jailer. I think I would want one more graveyard hate slot if I ran forward with a deck list like this one. And then the question is like do I want to play something that's tutorable with recruiter recruiter of the guard or not? And like when you're playing three recruiters, one of the nice things is that you can go and and have that luxury. The issue though is that like containment priest is like the nice tutorable one. And I won't do much against lands, and it's not gonna do much in very many of these matchups. So like it'd be good against reanimator and elves specifically, but like we ignore elves, we don't think about that when doing deck building because the matchup's so bad. And it's just fine against Reanimator, but it doesn't stop some of their nuttiest nut draws. So this actually might be a time where we want to go and like throw a fairy into the sideboard because it's still tutorable. It's good against like both lands and reanimator in that you can pick out key cards. Yeah. Yeah, you 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 reached the same conclusion I did probably about the same time. Yeah, but that that might be the additional graveyard hate card of choice. So that would leave us with three graveyard hate cards. And again, when you play Chalice of the Void, um, you're hedging against combo in different directions, and so that decreases sort of how much you can do with uh, with the graveyard hate. You know, in the in the past, DNT often had something like six graveyard hate cards, but if you want to like slam these chalices into the sideboard and still play a couple of brutal like haymakers, you you've got to make the cut somewhere. And then we could do something like add another wing mare to the main deck and then put palace jailer here. All right, this seems pretty reasonable. So what would be the weakness of a deck list like this one if we submitted this? And the answer is probably Dread of Night. Because we're playing Mom, Thalia, Wisp, Wingmare, Recruiters, and the back end of Spirit Keeper that are all just going to die to a Dread of Night. So is that a problem? I don't think so. So let me explain why. So let's assume other people are sitting down to do this, and they know that the person is going to play D&T. That's one expected D&T deck in a metagame that looks like this. So if you're playing Dread of Night, you're playing it for one person in a field of, what, somewhere on the order of, like, probably 30 to 40? That doesn't seem good. Now, there are going to be other cards that we'll see play that will, you know, be a kick in the pants. You know, the Grixis Control decks, they, they might have something like, you know, Marsh Casualties or Dark Blast or something of that nature. And that's totally, totally reasonable. But I don't know that Dread of Night makes sense in this metagame as a sideboard card. So I think that's probably okay as a whole. So, the, the, nec the next question we're going to have to ask, once we're comfortable with this, this deck list, is, is going to be, does this deck list still work with some in and out numbers? Hey, hey, welcome. Prelate 2 over Wingmare 2 hedges slightly against Dread of Night. Um, I would agree with that statement. But I don't know that it's necessary be necessarily better, right? Like, Wingmare still trades with Delvers. It's better with our one of Ancient Tomb. You know, it's a real powerhouse play against both combo and control when you get the one-two punch of, like, Thalia into it. And it still gets into the red zone, even when its ability isn't super relevant. Three Mother of Runes is great. Did you get to the three swords to plowshares yet? Because we're doing that, too. We are, we are building a list for a local metagame, uh, in case that wa that wasn't clear from uh, the, the title. Let's update that and say local metagame.
So I'm looking over this one more time, kind of making sure I like what we have. And I think it makes sense. There is a question of, like, do I go deeper on the ancient tomb? And, like... <laughs> yeah, three, three, three ports as well. We're, we're breaking all the deck-building rules. Yeah, so, like... A second ancient tomb might not be unreasonable in this meta, but I really think that would be pushing it. You know, DNT is a, a deck with a lot of mana sinks, like with Recruiter of the Guard and Palace Jailer, you know, port equipment, all all that jazz. I think it's totally risky to run multiple ancient tombs. Um do I like third Karakas in this meta? I mean, I'm pretty anti Karakas right now. I'm pretty pro basic planes. So, like, if Miracles has back to basics, like, you want basic planes. I think the days of, like, one Thalia plus Vile plus Karakas just, like, being the be all end all, I think those days are largely over. Like, so many of the Miracles decks have Mentor now to just pivot, and there's main deck answers to, to like, the Vile problem, like Council's Judgment and sometimes EE that didn't used to be there. So, I don't... There's not a lot of Wasteland in this meta, so there's that. Like, the Delver deck is going to have them, the Lands decks are going to have them, the Depths will, will probably have, like, one, but that's more for utility. It's it's still like Caracas is still very good there. So like what what is Caracas like stellar against? So Caracas will be stellar against like depths, good against lands and sneak and show. What will it be bad against? It will be bad against Delver. Probably lean towards bad against miracles, but, you know. Obviously situational there, but the fear of back to basics is very real. And, like, going to be bad against a red prison deck. I don't think three Caracas is unreasonable by any stretch of the imagination for that sort of thing. But I'd still probably play two. Oh yeah, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned reanimator or not, but yeah, good good there. Yeah, that's that's totally a reasonable consideration. All right, so we've we've got a deck list that looks pretty good. It looks pretty well tailored to this. And so the next thing I want to do is kind of make sure our in-out numbers look okay. Um, so I'm not going to do like a perfect sideboarding guide for this deck list or anything. I'm just going to kind of skim over and just kind of do some generic looks at some things and see if our, our list still makes sense after we kind of think out sideboarding for a couple of matchups. Because we might find that, oh, we put in too much for some matchup. I mean, there, there's going to be a handful of Miracles players there, so you can probably expect multiple flavors of Miracles. Alright, so let's, let's sort this by converting mana cost now. Alright, so like, let's say that I'm going to play against Delver. So what do I want? I probably want the Paths, the Plow, the Council's Judgment. So I have five cards here. What probably don't I want? So I probably don't want Revokers. They're pretty bad. I'll probably want to trim or cut Recruiters. And I usually get rid of Sanctum Prelate as well, just because it's super awkward with your Swords and Path, which are your best cards in the matchup. So generally speaking, against a Delver deck, we're probably going to be in an okay situation as far as sideboarding goes. So not not worried about Delver. That looks fine. All right. So let's say we're playing against uh, a control deck. You know, let's say we're playing against Grixis Control first. So what would I want against them? I'd want 
Palace Jailer, Chalice, <laughs> main deck Chalice instead of Moms. Just go full blown crazy. Uh, it really depends on what your opponent is playing in Grixis uh, Delver to depend on whether or not Jailer is good. That's a card that often gets ported out in that matchup. Yeah. So if we're playing against Grixis Control, this is probably the sort of stuff that we're going to want. So we're going to want to board out 8-ish cards. That's easy because I board out Moms and Swords since we're bringing Chalice in. And then we can cut two other cards. So I usually cut a Revoker against this deck. And then we can probably just cut something like a Flicker Wisp to round it out. So against Grixis Control, the numbers are going to work. Um, how are we going to board against Miracles? Probably pretty similarly, honestly. Like, we're going to do the same thing where we cut Swords and Moms, trimming a Revoker and Flicker Wisp or something like that to round things out, or maybe a land will be fine. Alright, so against the the Delver decks and the Control decks, we're, we're looking okay. Our bit's tax deductible. Uh... Yes? Dahlia approves. I don't know what that means for the U.S. government, though. It's like a donation. It's probably fine. Okay, so what if we're going to play against some combo? We, sh we should probably make sure a couple of those work out. Um, so, like, let's say we're going to play against Storm. Like, let's say we're going to play against Ant. So what are we going to want for those? Probably Surgical, probably Relic Warder, even though it's medium. I usually bring in Council's Judgments in case they are playing Dread of Night, which may or may not make sense for this metagame, so that might not actually be good. I'll probably bring in Chalice. So eight-ish cards. Jailer can go. Swords of Plowshares can go. Um, a piece of equipment can probably go. Like, let's board out a Jitte. Probably board out, like, a Wisp pretty safely. And then, like, you could maybe trim Moms or cut a little bit more on the top end, like either Wisps or Crusader. So, like, that would be fine. Uh, what if we're going to play against something like Reanimator, though? We're going to play against Reanimator. It's going to be super awkward because, like, we're on the Chalice plan. So that makes the Reanimator matchup just all sorts of odd. Reanimator's weird because you board, like, 13 cards, which is a relatively unreasonable number. So we can probably start by cutting our equipment package and cutting our Mother of Runes. That would give us 10 of the 13 slots right there. So that's a good indication that we're going to get there. And then we can probably cut, like, one one land of some nature. Um, and maybe, like, a Wisp and a Crusader. Or now, maybe, like, a Spirit Keeper. I'd have to, like, think about that for a minute. But it, it seems like you can get to about the right numbers. So that seems fine. All right, uh, let's say that we're going... <laughs> Hashtag not a lawyer has been deployed. Sound, sounds reasonable. Okay. So let's say like we're going to play against a Chalice deck. Let's, let's pick Red Prison. So if I'm playing against that, I'll probably want Cataclysm, Jailer, Chalice, Council's Judgment, Relic Order. Yeah, it, it's warped because of the Chalice. So... Reanimator is the one matchup where I really don't love having the chalices in the sideboard. Like, that's the one where it's just, like, god-awful awkward. Because, like, one of your best cards is a one-drop, and your removal are one-drops, and Mom's, like, a fine creature. Like, it's super awkward because of Chalice. So, when I'm not playing Chalice, I keep Mom's in for the Reanimator matchup. Although sometimes I end up trimming one. 
Okay, so sorry, I was I was talking about red prism. Uh, blue and ill, like there's worse though, right? Like it's worse when they like discard your palace jailer and then reanimate it, and you just like hate yourself. So that's not the end of the world. Yeah, th th this is a this is a thinking stream, right? Like we're we're trying to like talk through some things, do do a little bit of problem solving rather than just jam games tonight. Okay. So these are the cards that I want for Red Prison. So what do I not want? Uh, not really a Mirror and Crusader matchup. Wait, what am I thinking? I want Chalices for Red Prison. I want these six cards. Uh, so I probably don't want Mirror and Crusader. I probably will cut the Swords to Plowshares, especially when I'm on the draw. But... Like, if they're playing the 8 Rabble build, then, like, there's some tension there, and you might want to consider leaving some of these in. So then I'd want to, like, cut two more cards. This would be a build that's relatively well positioned to bully Red Prison. Like, with the main deck Wingmares and the third Recruiter and Jailer. Spirit Keeper, probably medium here. Like, there's some worlds where, like, you play it and they are, like, forced to kill it with their Chandra and you get a bunch of dorks, but those are probably few and, and far between. And then you could trim, like, one land or, like, maybe a mom or something like that and end up in an okay position. All right. So it looks like our sideboarding numbers are going to go and work out for this deck. Now, I didn't go and do a whole bunch of matchups or anything, but just kind of like taking a quick look at it, our in-out numbers don't look like they're too skewed in any one direction. So kind of one of the last things you want to do once you think you've got a build tuned for your local metagame is ask yourself, like, what are the weaknesses of my build? What am I opening up myself to when I submit this deck list? Because we have, yeah, we have an expected local metagame. But sometimes a handful of people show up in a car and just fill your event with things that you're not expecting. Or sometimes players randomly switch to other decks because they're afraid of being hated out or they don't think their deck is well positioned at this exact moment. And so the thing you kind of want to ask yourself is like, am I hedging too far in any one direction where my deck is no longer game one reasonable against the field more generally? Or am I like not leaving myself with enough sideboard cards for, for certain matchups? So what, what's the weaknesses of this deck? I think that's kind of obvious. Like, we've hedged by making our deck worse against aggro and slower. So if you kind of look at the picture we've painted, we've added an ancient tomb, removed the swords, removed a mom, and shifted our curve a little bit more this direction. Now, some of the cards that are at this three-drop slot on the curve are very good against the expected metagame. It's not like we're really going on the deep end and like playing like Palace Jail or Anshalai and Restoration Angel or or anything of that nature. Like we're not just really gumming it up at the four slot. We've just shifted things a little bit heavier towards the three. I think that's okay, but we are we are admittedly slower. And the sideboard doesn't really fix that problem. So I wouldn't be super enthused to go and play against some things like Eldrazi Aggro playing this deck. I I don't necessarily think I'd, I'd go so far as to say, like, that's going to be a problem matchup. But, like, 
removing a swords from the main deck can be pretty detrimental to that matchup. And many of the flex slots, like the wing mares and the, the prelates, do borderline nothing in that matchup. And like recruiters very slow there as well. Uh, so that's something I'd be afraid of. To just No, I, I think the the Eldrazi matchup, generally speaking, I th I think is is fine. Like let let's compare it to a stockish deck stockish deck list. So here's what I'm testing right now. So, like, against Eldrazi, you know, I've got the usual, like, Swords and Stoneforge Mystic Package, and I've got Brightling to gain life as well. I'd, I'd feel totally confident playing against Eldrazi with, with this build, because, you know, I'm, I'm geared a little bit more towards stability, I don't have a land that hurts myself, I have multiple main deck sources of life gain in, like, Brightling, Jitte, Batterskull, I have a Jailer here, a second one in the board. I'd, I'd feel pretty darn good against Eldrazi with this shell. Now, it's only a few cards different from what we're thinking about here, but those few cards can be game-changing. Yeah, Eldrazi Post is is much trickier than Eldrazi Aggro, because, like, they can go over you pretty easily, and Port and Wasteland only hold back things so long. Um, where's that local metagame list? If instead this was, like, two Eldrazi posts, I'd probably throw a third Cataclysm into the sideboard. A third Cataclysm in the sideboard is probably, like, totally reasonable for this metagame, by the way. Like, playing Cataclysm 3 over Jailer 2 is probably fine. Jailer 2 is just nice for the sneak and show matchup, where, like, just having another thing that you can drop in um, makes them play the, the guessing game and makes that a little bit harder. Um, and at the point where you play the third Cataclysm, like, you'd probably play Flagstones, yeah. Whether or not that's worth it because of things like Back to Basics and, like, Wasteland Recursion from Lands and whatnot and, like, Blood Moon effects over here, that's, that's a whole nother question. But, like, that's the, that's the sort of things that, that I would be thinking about. Um, yes. The mirror would also be a bit of a concern for for this matchup. Like, let's let's pull the flex slots aside again. So, like, Prelate is garbage. Mirror Crusader is very medium. Uh, Spirit Keeper is medium. Wing Mare like flies, but the ability is not super relevant. So, the cards that are in the flex slot of this deck are very poor against DNT. Yeah, so you, you say that Flagstone's getting wasted doesn't matter that much until you play against the good lands player who's like, that land's gonna enter tap this turn, pal. <laughs> Ain't that a shame when he does it during your upkeep and, like, takes you off of mana for a turn. Or, like, the ghost quarter comes out and then, like, you legitimately get ran out of lands. Th things happen. I've been I've been on the wrong side of that grind a, a few times, so I'm I'm cognizant of it, even though it's not necessarily common. And if we look at the sideboard for DNT, like we have cards that we can bring in, but like Thalia is also pretty medium in this matchup, and we like we cut the Walking Ballista from this list, and we don't have anything like Sword of War and Peace there either. Um, so the I'd say, like, I wouldn't be excited to play it the Mirror, I wouldn't be excited to play against Eldrazi, but otherwise, for the expected field, this this deck feels pretty good. Hey, Phil, how pimp is your real-life DNT deck? Uh, most of the deck is foreign. Um, I have foreign printings of versions that I like, not necessarily, like, the, the original ones, because, like, I'm I'm fine with some of the the updated art, except Mother of Runes. I I don't like the sexy mom. It's it, it's not for me. Great piece of art. I just don't think it looks like Mother of Runes. I get the runes part, not the mom part from that. Uh, 
Let's see. Yeah, I don't I don't really know that there's a way to like fix the mirror without kind of changing some of our game plan around. Like we're we're already hedging in very different directions. Like we could play a, a sort of war in peace, but like it's good against miracles and some of the combo deck, but it's not like stellar without the mirror running around. So I don't necessarily want to do that. And again, like we reached the conclusion pretty early on that the walking ballista was only going to be meeting medium in this metagame. Um, I don't know that I agree with that statement. Ancient Tomb is great in the mirror. I'd say Ancient Tomb is sometimes great in the mirror. Like, at the right time, that one mana pushing you ahead is crazy. But then there's other times where, like, you're in a close game and the life loss over time is very relevant, or, like, it just gets wastelanded, and it, it feels bad. But I've definitely had games where my opponent goes, like, turn three, Ancient Tomb, just say equip, and it's like, oh god, the game is over. Yeah, so, like, the, the flex slots that we're playing are hedging against control and combo, but not the sort of control that DNT is. Yeah. So, um, I, d I do want to talk about Ancient Tomb for a minute, because I think the card's really neat. It enables you to do some really weird things in this deck. Uh, so, for example, like, it can let you play double turn one Aether Vial, it can let you, like, turn one Revoker or turn one Jitte that you normally can't do, and it turns your, like, two colorless and a white cards into effectively two drops, which is super strong. <laughs> yeah, like, turn one vial into turn two recruiter is neat. And, like, that can let you, like, say, put in a Mother of Runes or, like, fetch up Thalia or Stone Pours so you can vial it in the next turn. Uh, like, so let's continue on that, that exact sequence, right? So you go, like, vial into recruiter you can get Stoneforge, turn turn three, Vial in Stoneforge, get Jitte, assuming you have a third land, you go like, land Jitte equip, and you're swinging in with Recruiter that turn. It's it's cool. Uh, yeah, it plays around days, but the, the question you have to ask yourself then is like, playing around the days worth the two life. And a lot of times my answer is like, nope, I'll play plain step two and see if they have days. Like, it, it depends on what the, the rest of the texture of your hand is. And Weisenberg, super glad to hear that. Uh, congrats on your, your win for a, a local event. I, I know those always feel good. I wonder if you got to do any of the fun stuff like this. As a side note, Ancient Tomb plus Chalice of the Void, obviously, like, great staple legacy combo, right? Now, your chances of drawing your one Ancient Tomb plus your Chalice of the Void in your opening hand, now that's low. But I definitely have a screenshot of, like, a turn one I did, I think it was against, like, Cyrus or something like that, where I went, like, Chalice on zero, Ancient Tomb, Chalice on one, pass. And it's just like, well, okay. Yeah. So, in the hypothetical world where I wanted to go deep for this tournament, and I wanted to say, like, all right, I'm willing to not play safe. I'm willing to take some risks. I'd consider cutting a second port, playing a second Ancient Tomb, cut a couple of these white, white cards, and just, like, play more Bryn Wingers and just, like, really hedge for the combo and try to, like, play Thalia into Vren Wingmare as many times in the tournament as I could. Now, that's a, that's a very different take on DNT, and at some point you end up being, like, close to a white Eldrazi deck, which is kind of, like, wanting to do similar things, but can do it more consistently, and so I don't really know that that's a safe plan, but... 
it's something that I would consider for a skewed metagame. And, and that is what we have here, right? This is going to be very skewed towards combo and control. <laughs> All right, so this was kind of my little talk on, like, how do we build a deck for a, a local metagame? And so for the expected metagame that's presented here, I would play something within a card or two of this and be very happy with what I submitted. Regardless of what I, I got paired against, I'd be happy submitting something like this for the event. Alright, so I want to open it up to you, chat. What questions or comments do you have about sort of the process that we just walked through here? getting the crickets. Maybe that means I did a decent job of doing this. All right, well, I'm very happy to hear that then. I guess I'm not hearing anything, but that's fine. Is that list of flex cards on your, your site, your, your scroll through list? No, but let me make a note to myself. I should really do that. I've said many times, like, I need to make a flex slot page. I'm gonna, I, I, did I do that yet? All right, creature selection. Yeah, I did do that, okay. So under deck building, there is a creature selection tab. I'm just gonna pull that over here. The creature selection tab has sort of a brief description of a lot of the cards that you can play in the flex slots and sort of when they're good and when they're bad. All right. Good, good job, Passville. You actually did one of the things you said you were going to do. Uh, now, this is the creature selection, though, so this is not necessarily some of the things that you would see, like, floating in and out of the sideboard, and it doesn't necessarily have some of the more fringe stuff, but most of the stuff that realistically floats in and out of the deck is, is going to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm glad this was, this was enjoyable. So... I'm trying to make some of my streams from time to time things that are just like educational and useful rather than just playing matches all the time um, because you know I am trying to be Frave in university right like I am trying to teach so I think videos like this are really good from time to time so when the opportunity pre presents itself I'm trying to do these. When if ever would you play Gideon, Ally of Zendikar over Cataclysm? Okay so let's look at the expected metagame for this event and like let's try to answer that question here. So, for what we're seeing, is Cataclysm or Gideon going to be better? Well, against Delver, neither are relevant. Against Control, Cataclysm is the harder-hitting lights-out card. Gideon, still very good. But in the Control matchups, there's kind of a difference. Gideon is a card that tends to be better when you're about even or you're a little bit ahead. It's worse when you fall a little bit behind. So the thing you're you're like most worried about is like you play Gideon, you make a token, and your opponent goes like bolt the token, Snapcaster, bolt Gideon, attack Gideon with Snapcaster, and you've just like lost your four mana investment, and that, that feels terrible. But when you play Gideon and you've already got pressure on board, and then you're like, you know, Gideon, make a dude. I still have two or three creatures in play. Uh, you know, Gideon plus swing in, crack you for like nine damage or something like that. Like those those can be awesome situations. Whereas Cataclysm is one of those things that can like really dig you out of a hole. You know, your opponent has passed the turn with like seven lands and a Jace and you're just like Cataclysm. It resolves and you take the game back over. Now if we look at the rest of the things going on here, like we can see other spots where we might want to bring in Cataclysm, right? Like against the Red Prison deck against the Cloud Folks deck, maybe against the lands, depending on what your boarding plan is. Like, there's other spots where Cataclysm is going to be good, but let's look at Gideon. Against the rest of this, where are we going to bring in Gideon? I guess against this deck? 
and like maybe that's it. I think in this context, Cataclysm is going to be better. Now, when might you play Gideon instead? Well, let's say there's a bunch of Eldrazi aggro in the metagame. Then playing Gideon to make, you know, infinite chump blockers forever, that's pretty valuable. If there's a little bit more of the mirror, Gideon is a card that I've often brought in for the mirror as a way to just kind of like change the direction the game is going, you know, invalidate some of the, the ground-based attackers, you know, put put some pressure on them to, to deal with it, or it just poops knights forever. So I don't think this is the metagame for Gideon, but it it definitely exists. So if the metagame was more mid-rangey, and we were seeing more DNT, Maverick, maybe Loam, things of that nature, where like you're gonna play a mid game that's impacting the board a lot, then I think Gideon can be better. But right now I probably like Cataclysm over Gideon. Ooh, sure. This is a this is a good question. So Crip Rat asks, all right. I guess I'll just kind of summarize. You know, what's what's the, the Phoenix matchup like, and, and how should we approach that? Um, let's look at a more traditional, well, not traditional, like, let's look at what I'm playing right now and answer that question. All right. So, as far as the main deck goes, in game one, you really want to stick Thalia to try to prevent them from just producing three phoenixes. That's the fear, is that they will just quickly go like, cantrip, dark ritual, buried alive, attack you for nine. So you want to play Thalia in game one. That's like one of your strongest early game cards. It's probably the card that can push you into a winning position and let the rest of your deck do its thing. Now, the, the other cards that I think matter a lot are probably your stone forges. So if you get an early stone forge and you actually get a piece of equipment into play, if the phoenix has come along a couple of turns later, you can potentially race them or at least have the chance of stabilizing. So like plan A is like, let's put Thalia into play or, or something like Sanctum Prelate as well, and prevent them from doing their thing. Plan B is try to stabilize against the Phoenixes. Now you'll notice I haven't mentioned any other card other than the Phoenix. This is intentional. The rest of their deck doesn't really matter. Now, this is a little bit hyperbolic, and I understand that statement, but really, the way you lose to the Phoenix deck is to the phoenixes. If they have something like some young pyromancers, or some delvers, or some baleful strix, or something like that, those aren't that big of a deal. You're fine against a worse Grixis control deck. You're fine against a worse Grixis delver deck. Or remove another color, or add another color, whatever. It's the phoenixes that are scary. So in game one, try to stick Thalia as soon as possible. Sanctum Prelate being a worse, but very, very solid second. If that doesn't work and they get those things into the graveyard, start trying to work your game towards stabilizing. The problem here is that, yes, your opponent does have a lot of discard. You should probably expect them to be playing about eight discard spells in their main deck if they are on sort of a Grixis build. So they could just go to like Thought Seize into Therapy You, and that buys them time to get the Phoenixes into play. You know, if your Thalia gets countered and your Stoneforge gets, you know, hit with Discard or something like that, you might be in a position where you stumble around slowly, and your things like your Flicker Wisps and your Mirren Crusaders aren't necessarily going to look amazing in that matchup. As far as the post-sideboard games go, Chalice is stellar against that deck. It it really hits them hard. So you'll have, like, maybe Chalice, Rest in Peace, Surgical, potentially, like, Path as well as additional removal for the Phoenixes, 
Uh, again, awkward with Chalice of the Void, though, so it depends on your exact 75, whether or not you're, you're bringing it in. Um, but, yeah, you're, you're trying to stop game plan A of Phoenix, and whatever their plan B or C is, you're, you're okay against those. Just, like, try not to get Phoenixed. Uh, what would you want to Council's Judgment? Let me ask you that question. Do you want to play, pay three mana to get rid of a Phoenix that they got for free? For free? I mean, obviously it involves some setup, but, like, probably not, right? So, like, there are some things that they could play where, like, maybe you want a Council's Judgment, it, but it's, it's not going to be the best. Okay, depends on the state, but which equipment would you fe fetch first? I'd imagine Sword of Fire and Ice or Batter Skull to try and race. Yeah, so it's contextual. Like, let's say you have a Mirror Crusader on board already, then getting a Sword of Fire and Ice to just like, all right, I'm going to close this game in two turns. Let's go. I'll draw some extra cards, you know, hit you in the face for a bunch. That's probably great. But, you know, like, let's say for some reason, like, you're in top deck mode and you just draw Stoneforge Mystic. It might just be Batter Skull to just, like, get a source of life gain. So, like, Batter Skull negates, like, 1.3 phoenixes, right? Because, like, you, ne you negate the three attack of the first and, like, one of the three points of damage from the second. So it, it ends up being pretty effective. Now, not necessarily gamer winning, right? If they, they produce three phoenixes and you're gaining four a turn, like, that's not necessarily the most sustainable thing in the world. Yeah, Jitte is generally the worst, but everything's contextual, right? If they have some of those side creatures in play, like, you you may get a chance to do some crazy things with Jitte. Um, like, I've had situations where they're, like, trying out, like, the, the blue-red Terramancer build, and they they go and, like, play two of them out, but they don't have the mana to adapt it. So you, like, get Jitte counters and you kill two in one turn or something like that. So, like, there are the weird scenarios where it can be very good. Yeah, Batter Skull against them is great if you're pretty sure it's going to stick. You know, when the Batter Skull doesn't stick and it just gets thought seized, it, it feels pretty rough. Uh, would a one of Remorseful Cleric in the main deck be useful or just too little versus Phoenix? Um, for that question, I'd say it's totally useful, but on their best draws, it's too slow. Like, it's... It's okay when you're on the play, especially, but on, on the draw, like, there's a lot of times where, like, they just go, you know, Dark Ritual, Herpaderp, before that card matters. You know, it's kind of similarly to why Rest in Peace is medium in the sideboard right now. Second card, is a card like Orem's Chant on your radar for sideboard slots? No. Definitely not. Ignore this 2006 deck list. Um, I don't really think Orem's Chant is, is worth a card in the metagame right now, especially since I'm playing Chalice of the Void, and Chalice of the Void plus Orem's Chant together doesn't really play well together. All right, chat. Any any final questions for me while we're just kind of talking about Phoenix or adjusting lists for your local metagame? Um, while I'm waiting to see if you have any other thoughts, um, I do have a donation deck list for Wednesday. On Wednesday, I'm going to be playing um, a four-color loam. I got a donation for that from a friend of mine. Um, and I'm going to be trying out, I think it's called Cinder Vines, the red-green enchantment that you can sacrifice to destroy an artifact or enchantment. And it also deals one damage to someone, I think, anytime they cast a non-creature spell. I think that card's cool and low, so I want to try that out. I'm going to try to get a deck list from someone that has one. Uh, so that's that's the next planned stream. Uh, what do you think about Karn over Gideon? Uh, so Senior Larson, I think there's kind of a couple stages of thought here. So, like, question one is, like, are you willing to run Gideon over Cataclysm? And in a world of miracles and Grixis control, the answer to that might be no. But assuming you want to play a Planeswalker, like which is better, Karn or Gideon, 
Karn's minus sucks in this deck. Like, generally speaking, the Karn token that you're making is either going to make be your, your like, first or second artifact. It's not like in Red Prison, where, like, you're playing, like, Moxon and Chalice and, you know, randomly things like Ensnaring Bridge and all sorts of things of that nature. Or, like, a deck like Antiquity Wars, where you just have tons of artifacts. So I think the aggro side of Karn is bad. And so if you're playing Karn, it needs to be for the plus side. And the plus side of card reads, the Karn basically reads, draw two cards, your opponent picks one of them and puts it into your hand. And you get the worst one every time. Unless your opponent is bad. And that seems kind of medium to me for a four mana commitment. Now, other people obviously disagree with me, because like some people like Enavolts and um, Scabs on MTGO have like played that in some of their deck lists. And it's, it's, it's done some work for them. I'm just really, really skeptical about Karn as a card in this deck. I love it as a legacy power level card. I just don't think that it's good in DNT. I think it's better in decks that have more copies of Ancient Tomb and more artifacts. All right, how do you feel about Spirit Keeper? I know it's great against Grixis Control, but it's useless against most of the meta. Yes. That is exactly correct. You play Hollowed Spirit Keeper when you are expecting a lot of Grixis control. That is a card that very specifically hedges against that deck while having some uses elsewhere. The Grixis control matchup is bad. So, like, hedging against that in game one is okay. Uh, this is a card that absolutely is fine to play in the sideboard. But in an event that's this small, like, you know, if we're, we're expecting 30 to 40 people and a good percentage are going to be on Grixis decks of some nature, that's a fine card to have around. Yeah, so, like, Karn can be a, a source of bodies, but so can Gideon, right? So, Gideon always makes a 2-2. Karn will... Probably usually make a 2-2 followed by a 3-3, but you're down ticking while doing that. And whereas Gideon, when you're making those 2-2s, you're just zeroing, so you're staying at the same loyalty. So you leave yourself flexible to like attack with Gideon or um, like minus and create an emblem. So if you look at damage over time for something like Karn versus Gideon, so both are zero on the first turn, right? Like let's say both times they like create a token. The next turn you minus Karn again, and you, let's say you swing in for three. The next turn, if you Gideon plus, you hit for seven instead, right? So Gideon can present a lot more damage quickly. Sure, but would, would the same thing be true of Gideon? Right? So, like, I know you wouldn't necessarily go and get cards with it, but if your opponent, like, deluges your board, and you have Gideon left, and you just, this, like, alright, you've tapped out to deluge, you know, Gideon plus, whack you for five. And, like, that's still awesome. Or even if you just, like, keep making tokens after that, like, a... The ability to whack for five or create a 2-2 two -two token is probably just as good as the worst of the top two cards of your deck. That's kind of my general thought there. All right, folks, um, I intended on tonight's stream to be a short one. I had some plumbing issues earlier today that I had to uh, deal with when I got home, so I am, like, absolutely exhausted right now. Um, so I'm actually going to call it a night for the stream. Uh, this is far, far shorter than, than what I usually do for a stream, but I'm, I'm just absolutely wiped. I came home to a lot of standing water, and uh, that, was, uh, that was not fun. So I'm going to call it here. I will be back on Wednesday with some four-color loam content, and I, I hope you all have a great rest of the evening. I'm going to turn you over to Bryant Cook, who is streaming some Storm. And if you've enjoyed this, please, please let me know, you know, whether it's via Twitter or Twitter or YouTube comments or something. Let me know that you want to keep seeing content of this nature, or let me know if you'd rather just, like, always have me streaming. Uh, that sort of information is just 
<laughs> very good for me. Also, Thalia Guardian of My Heart is an awesome name. That is, that is strong. All right, that folks.